oh my god we're at episode nine already and there's so much more to discuss and i'm so excited about today's topic but first i want you to recognize that the bauman channel on youtube has reached 5,500,000 views. Now, compared to things that are trending, that's not very big, but in the art world, that is, and I'm so excited about that. But enough about me, let's talk about what we're gonna be talking about today. Today, I expose the 12 keys that artists need to be able to great, great art, and they are as follows. The concept, the central focal point, composition, brush strokes, edges, transitions, drawing, perspective, horizon line, memory skills, and angles. So sit back and relax. This is going to be an exciting, long video, but we must go through these exercises so we can move on. Today is going to be really an important day for, for what we're discussing. Uh, the first part of this uh, Facebook section, we're going to be d discussing the 12 keys. Now, that you've heard that a lot, I've printed a lot, but we've actually added another 13th key. So, for those of you who have the 12 keys, you, you'll have to wait for the 13th key. But I only add keys when I know that they're extremely important. Now everybody here, if you don't quite get these concepts, and I also have distinctions that we're going to be talking about. So first we want to kind of just start seeing you know, what it takes to be an artist and these 12 keys that I always talk about. First thing, what I want to do is, is discuss the three the distinctions that what it takes to be an artist. And when I get through with the 12 keys, we'll also go through and critique the paintings that came from the homework last week. And so we'll actually be applying some of the 12 keys that we're going to be discussing and applying it to our homework this week. So it's going to be kind of cool. So we'll try to do that within an hour. So the first thing, I thought long, driving around. I used to drive hours, six hours to, to go to class, and I would be thinking about all these things. People say, Stefan, where do you get all this stuff? How can you possibly just sit and come up with things out of your head? Well, you know, when you drive from Mount Shasta to San Jose for three years, once a week, and come back again, that's 12 hour drive. And then after three years, I did it for another 10 years, back and forth every other week. So I spent a lot of time in the car, and while I was in the car, I would think about things to teach and talk about and write about, and uh, yeah, I've been doing newsletters for years and years and years, and, and uh, been teaching for 40. So a lot of times my brain is just kind of filling, and I thought, well, what, what is really, what, what embodies the essence of a student? You know, as people say, what do you look for in a student? Yeah, and I thought about it, it's like, there are elements, or, or I call them pillars or distinctions, that I look for. And when people call it for coaching, I say, well, I've got to ask you three questions. If you actually pass these three questions, you can actually become a great artist. Not only great, you could actually become even a famous artist. So the first thing that one has to have to become a great artist is desire. You have to desire it. I get people all the time that they call me and they go, oh, I want to be an artist. And I go, well, what does that mean? And they go, well, I want to quit my job and uh, become an artist. It's just, you know, it's like somehow they get that, it, you know, all of the artists out there like Thomas Kincaid, where they, you know, they're all just making tons and tons and tons of money. Um, but the reality is, is that, you know, you don't really choose to be an artist. And you, well, you know, think about, I think a lot of people think their jobs are really hard. They, they spend a lot of time and hours trying to 
to uh, you know work and, and they they're frustrated. A lot of people live in desperation, wishing that they, they would be doing something else, and they immediately think back to high school, and they think, "What was I doing in high school? That was so wonderful." <laughs> well, I know not. I had to look back to high school <laughs> with any any glee. What was real interesting is, uh, you know, I pretty much throughout high school, I found, yeah, I did art and I started at 12, and then I found a book on Albert Bierstadt in seventh grade. Now, when I'm talking about desire, this is desire. You know, so I'm a young kid, I'm painting, you know, I'm bowling, not really connecting with art. You know, and then all of a sudden I saw this book on Albert Bierstadt, and nobody really knew who he, he was. It was like the first big book on Albert Bierstadt. And my school had it, and I checked it out and brought it back and checked it out and brought it out and you know, brought it back and checked it out and brought it back and checked it out, brought it all year long. So literally the back of the book was because every two weeks you had to bring it back, right? And I carried that thing around like a Bible. Just living that, drawing, you're just focusing on that. It's really that kind of desire. Bierstadt, you know, I grew up in Lake Tower and I talk about these, these things. And it's so funny because when I look at the comments on YouTube, people say, oh, when are you going to shut up and paint? Oh. I mean, I tell you, there's one of these crazy ladies that, you know, uh, uh, Monday morning I woke up and I, you know, I was getting ready at 4.30 and I was seeing whether or not I could get sleep in for a little bit and, you know, all of a sudden I look at my YouTube thing and it's all of a sudden she's just ranting and ranting. Oh she says, God. you're at number 23, you're, now you, there you go again, you're going on one of your stories again and, you know, on and on and on. And now she's actually part of my stories. So, you know, so I get, so anyway, so, so she, you know, and after a while, and I mean, some of them are like four or five paragraphs long. I mean, they're longer than the video. And I'm like thinking, you know, lady, if you don't like my station, don't watch it. You know, it's like, click it off. Don't tell me how to teach after 40 years. So then I go over to her station. She's got nothing, right? So I'm like thinking, okay. So I said, no more videos for you. Goodbye. And I just deleted her off my station which means you can't watch any more videos. But nonetheless, I could take criticism. But anyway, here's another story. So anyway, so I, I, um, I'm living up in Lake Tahoe, and I've got a little bit of introduction with James Featheroff, and I'm really kind of getting in the fact that I really want to become a painter. But it never connected, you know, because I never really saw other people's paintings. I grew up in Lake Tahoe, and I was a small boy in a small town in the woods. And so Bill Alexander wasn't, you know, uh, my lifestyle and over was Rob Ross. You know, they painted, but everything was, you know, fake. And then I saw Bierstadt's paintings, Albert Bierstadt. And all of a sudden I saw that the environment I grew up in could be rendered into a painting. In fact, not only that, I lived on the same street that he painted on, where he painted Mount Talak. I, I literally lived just 10 houses away from where the swamp was that he painted. And it's like, it's really unique to stand in the footsteps of Albert Bierstadt and grow up there. So I got this connection. And a lot of times when I get students when they're a little lost, and we go through the homework assignment and they're still lost, I have them copy some old masters, so they kind of get that the real world and painting are two different things, and they have to kind of start uh, looking at the world and seeing it in paint. And I think that's the biggest mistake, or the biggest problem that beginning students have. They just don't feel what a scene would look like. If I take you outdoors, they see that, but they can imagine a photograph of it, but what does it look like in paint? I saw the beer shots and all of a sudden I could see my world and how it should appear on canvases. And I started copying Bierstadt and I started looking for the places that he painted up in Lake Tahoe. 
And then, of course, I wanted to go to Yosemite because that's where he was. And I wanted to walk in the footsteps with him. Eventually, I found Thomas Moran. But I checked out this book over and over all year. Summer came, book back. Oh, did I have withdrawals. I mean, literally, this arm over here is literally an inch longer because of that book that I carried. I mean, it was like this thick and about this big. And I mean, I carried that thing around up, and, up on the bus, you know, back and forth. I had that thing on, under my arm for an entire year. Summer came, I was getting withdrawals. We didn't have the internet then. So the eighth grade, I checked it out all year again. Literally, the, they had to put more cards in the thing for all the checkouts and stuff. So come the end of the year, remember, we didn't have Amazon at the time. So about the last two weeks of ninth grade before we go over to high school. I have to confess at some point, but... You stole it. No, I didn't steal. No, I, my, I had my name all over, but I, I, I told him I lost it. Because I couldn't, I couldn't go without my beer stuff fix. I mean, literally. So I paid the fine, and I paid for the book, and it was, you know, like... Anyway, it was so full of paint, and so, you know, so earmarked, and, you know, I wrote in pens. I mean, it was, it was worthless anyway, you know. I still have it. It's one of the few books. I used to have thousands of books. Every time somebody would die because I teach so many students, I'd say, take her library, take her library. So I had books like you couldn't believe. And when I finally moved up here, I took all those books over a period of two weeks and stuffed them into libra library, you know, return box things. So in the middle of the night, I would be unloading because I didn't want to haul this stuff around anymore because Google was out there. Who needs art books anymore? No. Who needs a library? Yeah. Anyway, I digress. There's going to be a lot of people saying, libraries, don't touch them. But I think they're useless right now because Google is so much better. So, so that's what happened. But the desire was there. Oh, like nobody's business. And when you choose art, and some of my students are finding this out, they call up and they say, yeah, I kind of want to try to do painting. But once you get started, and especially once you start seeing the world through and understanding how we see it, like with Mrs. Gugolinsky, when you start seeing the world like that, it's addictive. I mean, pretty soon I get phone calls from husbands going, what have you done to my wife? My wife, because she's obsessed. She goes to bed at night, in the middle of the night she wakes up and she goes, oh, I just saw the most beautiful dream and I know how to paint it. So, you know, it's just, so, so it's really kind of uh, an interesting thing to desire something. The desire to become, it becomes part of you. And you can't let go. It's not a nine to five, it's a 24 seven, seven days a week. Um, so desire is the first uh, pillar that I look for, the first distinction. The second distinction is discipline. And I know some of you who are in my classes, this is, this is the problem that people have. It's like, oh, and every week my students go, Oh, I'm, this week I'm going to start on Thursday. I'm going to start on Thursday, and I'm going to work. I'm going to set up my still life first thing when I get home, and I'm going to do that. And all week I'm going to spend two hours a day painting. And I go, don't make promises you can't keep. Because if you, discipline is one of those things that you really have to. You can't go anywhere in life and become anything if you're not disciplined to practice. And that's what we have to do. Painting is practice. And you really can't become good unless you do an entire garage full of crap. After you kind of finish all that, then you can start going and call yourself an artist, but there's so much that you have to do. Just like playing the piano or playing golf, if you're not out there, you know, practicing, practicing, having discipline, putting in two to three hours. One of my students yesterday called me up and she goes, or was it this morning? I don't know. When you get up at 4.30, you get lost. But um, she called up, she goes, I'm getting up now at 5 o'clock in the morning with my husband. She used to sleep until 7. And I promised her I wouldn't give, put her name out there. But she says, oh my God, I'm getting so much more done. And I'm doing painting first. And that's kind of the discipline that you have to do. You have to find a place. And we don't find it, you have to carve it out with blood. You have to carve it and make it happen. Um, so, and then the third pillar that one requires 
is tenacity. And really, tenacity is what allows discipline to happen, and you've got to have discipline to fulfill your desire. But tenacity is like really giving up everything to, to do this one thing. Now, that doesn't mean you give up your family and stuff, but oftentimes you do. One of the problems with painting is that's a solitude business. You're by yourself. It's an activity. It's not a group activity, although a lot of people go playing or painting together as a group. But you can't sit and chit-chat and talk about, you know, grandkids or the weather and stuff when you're actually trying to nail, a, you know, a big wave on the beach and the wind's blowing and, you know, and the tourists are around. You really have to be focused. And when you're in your studio, if you really are tenacious and you're working, you, you, you're, you're not bothered by dinner time or anything else. You work and you get up and you make the effort to get up in the morning. And then, you know, part of that is also being tenacious about your career. One of my students in India, young girl, fabulous painter, unbelievable painter, but she lives in India. You know how hard it is to sell paintings in America? Can you imagine sitting in India trying to, to figure out how you're going to be an artist? Especially during the pandemic? But she's tenacious. She does her YouTube videos, she does her Instagram, she does her Facebook. And then I tell her, start making a list of, of art galleries. And so one beautiful thing about her, she's, she's like an angel when I talk to her, she's fabulous. But if I tell her, I want a thousand one of these, she'll go and deliver a thousand. Oh my God. She, she, I think she just doesn't want to dis disappoint me. But I'll go, okay, contact five galleries this week. Make a list of 50 galleries that we're going to hit. Um, and don't start off at the bottom, let's go to the top. And sure enough, she went to the best gallery in town last summer, and she said, what about me for a show? Now, what's amazing about her is that she's a plein air painter, like we do in the West, in India. If you can imagine that. So she goes out, now she lives in a big city. So she goes out and she lives in kind of this big square cement building with you know, 200 families. And she'll go out and try to find something to paint. And I hear people, they go, I can't find anything to paint. I go, look in your backyard. Oh, there's nothing there. She's got a tree that grows in the middle of the sidewalk. So she'll go paint that. A bunch of scooters all lined up that are you know, kind of falling over that have been abandoned. She paints that. The ice cream man coming around, she paints that. And then she goes with her grandmother out um, on the countryside. And she's doing Western plein air painting in India. You can imagine how weird that is for them. It's kind of like old, you know, painters doing plein air painting um, you know, here in the States 30 years ago when we first started, before plein air painting was anything. So here she is out there painting plein air painting on location. Um, but she's tenacious. And last summer, she got a gallery to accept her. And not just any gallery, but the best gallery in town. And so she's supposed to have an art show right now, but they are under lockdown. So they're waiting until then, and then they're going to have her, her, her show. But anyway, tenacity. You have to do beyond what is reasonable for any human being if you really want to make it. You've got to have that drive. It's not easy. So here's the 12 keys. Key one. Actually, it's 13 keys. I've got to get used to saying that. And we may be adding some more to that. But they really, I'm really careful with what I add. And my, my 12 keys are different than other people's top 10. Okay. So key one, before you start a painting, and this is where art fails, you have to have a concept. Without a concept, you are literally nowhere. And most artists, when I sit and, and watch them, they're so busy trying to get ready for, for their painting, and they're getting their paints out, and then they look up at the mountain, and then they go, ch -ch 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 -ch. and go, what are you doing? You know, where's your central focal point? Oh, well, I'll get to it. You know, but the light's changing. I go, 
That doesn't matter, especially when you learn how we learn to highlight with the, you know, the Bauman effects. Yeah, we teach you how to do that. So you're better off doing nothing. Ten minutes of silence. Basically, you have to have a concept. If you don't have a concept, don't start. Know where your central focal point is. Look to where you can do eye magnets. You know, is it a sunset, sunrise? One of the things I tell students is take out your cell phone. Don't do a noton, because in the process of doing notons, you're, you're not in the concept mode, you're in the doing mode. And when you're doing notons, you're actually uh, really on your, your left brain, because you're trying to factually figure things out instead of feel what it feels like. So take a snapshot of it real quick and edit it real quick on here, you know, within 30 seconds you can have an image, what you think is doable, and then hold on to that and just look at what's going on. And sometimes if you sit and look for five minutes, the light may shift and you might go, oh, that's a better idea. You know, and when you have that idea, freeze it in your head because it's going to go away. Monet said that Every painting, when you're outdoors, the light changes within seven minutes. So you, you, at best, some of you have watched light just be brilliant. By the time you get your camera out, it's already gone. Yeah. But you have to be present. Because that moment that you start, if you're in the morning especially, that morning when you start, that is the most crucial time. In fact, I refuse to give a demonstration to my students during that time. That is their time to be with the painting. I'll, I'll take 12 o'clock when it's hard. Most painting workshops, this, the teacher takes the first from 9 to 12. And of course, you know, when you're dealing with a lot of people, they, get, they start their workshops at 8. I start mine at 6, you know. And so, we, we get out there early, but the thing is, you've got to have a concept. You've got to sit there. You've got to look at it. Be with it. Because there's no way you're going to memorize it if you're not with it. You can't start at the mountains and then have all this stuff going on, and by the time you get to the foreground, you can't remember what it was. You have to literally try it. And the thing is, being able to memorize something is a learnable gift. You, people are think, oh, you're so gifted to be able to, to recall things like that. And it's like, no, I had to work on it. memory exercises to, to be able to do that. So concept, okay? Number two, once you have the concept down, focal point. I can't tell you how many times I will walk to, up to a student and say, where's your focal point? Where's your focal point? Focal point is key. It's a thing that says, hey, look at that. That's your focal point. And the thing is, you've got to learn to not only recognize a focal point, you've got to build upon it so that it's extraordinary. Because one of my rules, if you watch my videos, I always end saying, don't go outdoors or into your studio unless you're going to change the world. That's what we're out to do. My students don't do, you know, little mediocre work. They, their work has to be extraordinary. And so that thing has to be a focal point. It's got to be one. You're allowed to have two, two other focal points, and we'll talk about that as we start painting more and more. But the thing is, you've got to have one central focal point that grabs the viewer. There are so many good artists out there that if you don't grab the viewer first, you're just going to be walked by. So the focal point is crucial. And what's important with a focal point, it can't be a thing. It can't be a thing. And it can't be a thing that's white. So yesterday I was looking at a student that was doing a setup for a still life, and I said, where's your central focal point? And she says, well, it's the garlic, of course. And I go, why is it garlic? Because it's white. It's the lightest thing on the painting. And I go, you don't get, that's low-hanging fruit. A central focal point is something that is, is, is uh, caused by light. Now, I said if half the garlic was in highlight, then that would, that would follow, you know. But you, just because it's the whitest thing, it's got to be light, the effect of light. Something happening on the painting that the light comes in and graces the painting and make it an extraordinary moment. Third thing is obvious, it's composition. 
a common thing, you know, it's like, if you, if you think about composition, you kind of, there's certain things you have to kind of learn. Like you don't want to have two objects exactly the same size or three. And I can't tell you how many people do that where you'll have like, you know, one apple and then another apple and then a sugar bowl and they're all the same size. So things like if you're going to set together a composition, of course, one of the things is you don't use four. You don't have four objects. You have three objects or five. Do you know why you don't have four objects? Well, you could have a big, long vase and, you know, an apple. You could have two things. That would work. Three is kind of best. But four, why, why are people saying, don't do four? It's kind of a suspicious thing. You know, like there's no 13th floor on, on an elevator. Four in Asian, the word four means death. And so it's more of a superstitious. So four means death in, in Asian culture. So four is not a good word. So we skip over that and it's, and it's kind of left over like the 13th floor. Yeah, 13 floors are not bad luck, but alas. And then fifth floor. But the thing is what you want to have is a big object, something big. Maybe a grapefruit if you want something small that's big. And then have something that's medium like an orange and then a walnut. One, two, three. Big, smaller, smaller. Skip over four and then put in a different shape like a um, cloth or a bookmark or something long like a knife. So did you explain why four, no, not four, but like two would not be good? Well, she said two was, would not be good, but I kind of think, yeah, you could have something big. You can have like a wine bottle and a glass. You know, so you can have two. You can't have two of the same objects. Yeah, okay. You know, so like, because that's like, well, it's like, it depends on what they are. Um, but, you know, they could be pillars and stuff. So, and then the thing is, be creative. Yeah, I teach a lot of students, so I give them a lot of homework. And I tell them to do, you know, like, like, let's say, you know, a bottle and, uh, you know, or two bottles, and they end up with two bottles. It's like, throw one down. You know, make things interesting. The thing for the most part, and I can show this when we start talking about each one of these keys, we're going to be doing, you know, a talk on. And we'll be demonstrating each one so you can kind of get it. But the, the key um, uh, that, you know, with, with this composition is that I want you to get that you could turn anything into a good painting. If you watch all of my videos back, you see a lot of really crappy paintings done by my students over the last 10 years that I've been on YouTube. And you could see paintings that show up and you go, ah, that ain't nah, going to work. And I pull one of these lights down and I point it down. And all of a sudden it's like when you get a fo central focal point in there, you can almost make anything work. And I, I was talking about that at one of my other talks that was on YouTube. And somebody says, oh, no, you have to know what the L composition is because that's what you know, the old masters would talk about or the, or the, the diamond composition or you know, some talk about the W composition or, you know, the, the, I don't know. It's always this, like, you know, yeah, this, this, this. You can take anything, and I challenge you. And the thing is, my, my suggestion is if you want to paint something you don't want to paint, go into your kitchen cabinet take all of this stuff off the shelf, put it on your shelf where you want to paint from life, and then put a spotlight in it and start moving stuff down and pull stuff off and back and forth. Eventually something will happen. But if you can take the worst composition and put the light in the right spot, all of a sudden it will work because you're focusing, you're causing the people not to look at the things anymore because we don't paint things, but the effect of light. So composition is something that is, is powerful and you have to know some rules, but the thing is you can always go uh, and, and uh, correct a composition with light and I do it every day with my students. I can't tell you how many times I see bad compositions that don't work and we make them stunning by just putting lighting effects into them. Values. That's like on everybody's list. Why are you shaking your head? There's a lot of value in value. In fact, most artists out there will tell you, value, the most important thing 
to put together a painting. You, if you don't know your values, you're screwed. If you master your values, you'll never get, you'll never do wrong. It is the, the Everest of, of painting, and it's really not that hard, but the values are the lightness and darkness of colors, and oftentimes we see values when we squint, and oftentimes we get it wrong because we don't see the color or the, or the plane at a, at, you know, at a, at a gray scale. And, and so it's a matter of trying to figure out what's darker in front of something else. And the thing is, you know, values uh, have a lot to do with light. So like, if you have a plane like this, that's, that's like a meadow, the vertical trees will have, be a darker value. You know, so, so even when you think as things get darker, as they get further back, all of a sudden you have these grove of trees that are sticking up that kind of throw it off. And that's where people start getting kind of weird with values. But oftentimes when I sit and really tell them, squint down and compare the value in the front, how dark that is, compared to just those trees in the meadow back there, you'll see a slight value shift. And when I'm painting, people go, are you going blind? <laughs> and, you know, seriously, I am. I'm, you know, almost 60 now. But, but, you know, the thing is my eyes are getting weaker. And I'm finding as my eyes are getting weaker, I'm becoming a better painter. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about edges. But so, uh, so with perfect vision, I could see that I would squint down. And, you know, they say, are you going blind? I said, no, I'm like squinting, because that's how you see value. And you learn to see lights and darks. And some people will have, you know, yellow cards or red cards or blue cards that they carry around with them so that they can see the value and all that. I don't know how that is, but values are really important. They are, they are what artists say, the most important thing there is out there. Number five, the elusive temperature. I can't tell you how many times I get asked that question because it's big with me. I can't tell you how I worked with students to try to figure out what this elusive temperature thing is. I have been teaching for 40 years and I see a lot of people producing videos saying, the secrets to painting. In fact, I even produced a painting. You know, the secrets to landscape painting by Stefan Baum. You can go to my website, www.stefanbaum.com, and you could buy videos there that give the secrets to painting. But I did those videos before I really knew what the secret was. And there's only one secret after 40 years. And this is the temperature thing. Temperature is something that was you know, quite prevalent in old art. You see it throughout history. You see it up until the Impressionists, and then all of a sudden post-Impressionists say, oh, let's forget about that. Let's forget about golden mean canvases. The, the, the post-Impressionists decided to just dump education altogether and become stupid. And so all of these theories went away, and temperature seems to be the one that's still kind of out there. But if you master temperature, it becomes superior to value. Because we can create something that value can't, and that is to keep the value the same, the same uh, value. And within that conversation, we can actually change the temperature and completely give a range of, of light in a painting without changing the value at all. And value painters, they're stuck with just value. It's like the only way they can get anywhere is to put white into it. Oh yeah, my center focal point, throw more white, throw more white. They don't understand what light is. And when we start talking about temperatures, it will change the world for you all. Number six is brush strokes. Brush strokes are key. That's the thing when people come into my class, they go, I want to learn how to do loose brush strokes. I paint good, but I'm too tight. Well, first thing, when you're interpreting photographs, you will be tight because all you have as reference is that. When you're glancing at a form that's changing, or if you're glancing at, at a um, two or three-dimensional object trying to interpret it into two-dimensional, you can interpret that. But when you're looking at a, at a two-dimensional object and trying to do two-dimensional on your canvas, it's already interpreted for you, so you're going to have hard edges. But that wonderful thing that we talk about when we talk about the brush strokes, 
is actually mostly un, unfinished paintings. And it's not like the artists interpret it that way. They're going, I'm just going to leave my brush strokes. I'm just going to kind of do some sloppy stuff at the end and just pretend like, you know, I'm a master of painting. It's like, no, that's not, not necessarily so. That's not how it happens. Us artists that master these things, I go out on location, I can cover a canvas in probably 10 minutes. You know, and I'm not putting a lot of, a lot of energy in it. I'm just putting it in. I, I'll go back and work on it. I'm not saying it's finished. But then what happens is once it's in, I go in and put the central focal point out. And when I start developing the central focal point, there comes a point where I don't need anything else because when I'm standing out there, I'm not looking at the pine trees on the left in every branch. Those, I'm leaving all of that stuff alone and guess what's there? All those fancy little brush strokes that you think are purposely put in. They're actually preliminary paint strokes. So if you don't go out there and paint with vigor the whole thing at that time, you'll never get there. And I watch artists, they start from the top left hand corner and they work, <laughs> they work and they work, they're so tight. But literally it's, it's that spontaneous moment when you're out there and you're just putting sketch on you and you're, you're being, that's what people love. And that can only be generated before anything else is generated. So it's the first thing you put in. So brush strokes can be mastered, but you've got to be able to express them early, not at the end. Yes? No. No. Not if you know all the elements of painting. Because when you actually look at it, if we see, like, if you look at like Richard Schmidt's paintings, he could whip out one of those in a couple of hours. I can whip out a painting in a couple of hours. You know, so there's no secret to that. But if you try to paint everything in that time, yes, it's going to look crappy because you can't paint that fast. But if you learn with focal points and edges and brush strokes, how to put in a painting so that when at the end you can just concentrate on what it is that you want to say. You can develop, and most of those great artists like Sargent and Richard Schmidt who passed away a couple weeks ago, and uh, LaFell and all these artists, they know where to put the focus, focal point, where to put the focus. And when they get the viewer to look at that, you, you could go down and watch Barbara Streisand on stage. And there could be a thousand people on stage with elephants and, and, and camp guys and symphony and choir. All of that stuff could be going on. And then all of a sudden in the background you hear a voice. You go, oh my God, that's Barbara Streisand. She's here. She steps out on stage and the white light hits her and goes, you know, that spotlight that just, you know. And all of a sudden at that moment, all of that stuff goes away because your brain is now focused. And if you just painted Barbara Streisand on stage, you could just quickly put in all the other stuff and it wouldn't make, never mind. You're just filling up the canvas because you bring the viewer to what's important. Okay, number seven, edges. I always love this. It's like, I watch people on, on YouTube I don't know, sometimes I think I sound really snobby, but I've been teaching for 40 years and I'm becoming an old man, and guess what? I have a lot of stories and I have a lot of opinions. And I guess that's okay when you get old. They just go, oh, he's just old, forget about him. <laughs> but I watch artists and, and uh, you know, I, they, they kind of pull stuff out and they go, all I have to say about edges, you have found edges and you have lost edges. You have soft edges and you have hard edges. That's all. <laughs> Which ones? Oh, I don't know. Choose. You could soften this over here. We paint, and part of what I teach is how we see. And how the viewer sees. How, how a director shows you how things are, how, how artists, musicians, has you listen to the melody while all this stuff is going on. Edges are key. And you do have edges, if you're trying to create something rounder, you do soften the edges so that it gives the appearance of being roundness. And that's only really worried, uh, where you worry about that is in the central focal point area. 
But I talked about this last week. If I'm looking at your face, all I can see is your left eye. Or as I'm seeing your left eye, your right eye, because we're right eye dominant. Left eye. When I look at you, the right eye is blurred. Your hair is blurred. Your hands are blurred. And so what you do is you handle your edges to direct the viewer to your central focal point. And you can't get to the central focal point if you don't have a concept that that's what you want to do. And develop a composition so that that focal point's in the right area. Because that's part of de developing a composition is where do you put this? And we'll take apart and look at all these things as we go further on. But the edges are where you are looking at. In the area that you look at, you have the brightest light that's for the focal point. And then you have the hardest edges. You have soft edges on things that you don't want the viewer to look at. So when you go down the cereal aisle and you're looking at Cheerios, it says Cheerios. I like that. But in the, the corner, they give you these, you know, may cause cancer in children and if, you know, bad for your teeth and you should die and get diabetes. All the warning stuff is black type on top of green type. So you can't see it. Because they don't want you to see that. And you don't want to have people see stuff outside of the thing. You want them to see Barbara Streisand. Yeah. And that's where the hard edges go. Oh my God, we're going to be going through, well, I'm going to be doing paintings with all this stuff in it. So, you know, this Spellman effect is not just something you're going to get in three weeks. You know? And then if you, you know, sign up for the Patreon, you're going to even get this in steroids. Transitions. Yeah, again, I, my, top, my top 10, or my top 12, now 13, yeah, there's a lot of artists that don't even discuss transitions. And to me, transitions is key. And the thing is that transitions key, especially when we're working with temperatures. But transitions are also really important because transitions exist between lights and shadows. They also provide movement. So if you ever studied a piano, you see they have crescendos. And so, you know, a song would be nothing if it didn't have crescendos. And how you, you use your transitions from dark to light really pushes the viewer through eye magnets and th through your painting. And you're trying to get the viewer to, 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 to push through the painting using transitions. And, you know, that's key. From dark to light, that's key. But what's also important is that all of life lies between the transitions because you have light and that's the effect of light that hits it more that this here that's hitting me that what you see on here is more of the color of the light bulb and then my shadow areas shadows in here those have nothing to do with my face those are dark transitions exist in the middle there where they where you go from light to dark that is where you have local color. The color of the object without light or dark is where you find it in the transition. So between the highlight and the shadow of my face, there's going to be a little area that is actually local color. And that local color is so little on objects. When I have students, they work on portraits and they look like Barbies. It's because the, the, the highlights are the same color as the shadows, except one puts black in, which you should never do but black in a shadow, and they try to put white in the highlights, and they wonder why it looks stupid. You're just shaking your head like you've had that problem. So when you look at a lemon, where the light hits the lemon, it's going to be more if, you know, whatever light is hitting it, whatever color. If I change the light bulb to blue, it's going to be blue. The dark is absent of light, so it just goes into an area where there's no, there's no light. And that's actually very common. You don't even have to really give it a color of blue or anything. It just goes away from that. But the actual color of a lemon is in between the light and shadow. And it's usually just a little stripe. And not only within transition, I told you this is like the, the, the mother of things you need to know, is that in between lights and, and darks and the transition colors is where you have your texture. So in the area where the light's hitting the lemon, there's no texture in there. And where the light is hitting the shadow, or where there's no light hitting the shadow, there's nothing there either. 
The only place that you have the pores of the lemon are right in the middle where the transition is. So it's really key. Transition number nine is drawing. Now you don't have to be a good drawer to be a painter. You can, there's projectors out there. There's these things you can look through and you can like, oh, yeah. It's, but if you want to become a good artist, you have to master drawing. You can't get away from it. And no matter what project, I, I, uh, I hear artists, they go, well, I use a grid. And what's your source of your grid, your photograph? Do you know your photograph is completely out of whack? You know, it's out of proportion and everything. It's like distended and everything. No, I didn't know that. I thought it'd be okay to do a grid. So I put a grid on my photograph, which is already messed up. And then they go and put the grid on there and they go, why does that look so funny? And especially when you blow something up from a photograph on a grid, it does look funny, but you'll never learn how to draw that way. The best tool you can have is a prospect. A prospect teaches you proportions and students are like, oh my God, why didn't they tell us? And if you go into my videos, it's called the best kept secret. And I have some people who say, well, I knew that all the time, but the thing is, big society that doesn't know it. So it's, it's crazy, but that will teach you to draw, but basically drawing is proportions. And that's a whole nother distinction that, you know, obviously has its own thing. Nine, number 10, is that you have to also know perspective. Now the proportional divider will actually teach you perspective too, but perspective is something that even, you know, artists that have been painting for years still kind of have to try to get. And, you know, it's a learnable thing. It's easier for men to kind of wrap their heads around it than women. Women are more perceptual. Men are more like north and south. But, and it's kind of a science. But I went into Thomas Kincaid's studio at one point. And he had a drafting board in the middle of his studio where he painted. And he had long lines going off to both sides of the room. And he would manipulate these lines so all of those buildings he did would always be perfect in perspective. So you do have to learn perspective and it is possible and there are a lot of books. And you don't need to know how to make a, an ellipse and all this stuff, but one point, two point perspective is just all basically that you need to know. And the thing is in landscape painting is even more important. Because how you look at things and where you look at them has a lot to do with um, you know, how, are making a sense of place. You can't have perspective unless you have a horizon line. You can't get a sense of place unless you have a horizon line. And a sense of place is not yet on my 12 uh, keys, or 13 keys now, but it might be. But the horizon line is our relationship to the object. So oftentimes I ask people, so where's the horizon line? And they go, oh, it's where the sky meets the, the water. Or the sky meets the mountains. That's, that's their perception. But the horizon line is where your eyes are at. And so when you're looking at a building to do perspective, you kind of have to imagine if that door is you know, right at you, I hear how high you are to the door where your eyes would be, there's your horizon line. And what's really fun is when I'm working with people who know perspective, and they want to do a park where there's 50 people going into the distance. And I go, you know what's really funny about perspective? And they go, what? I said, well, we're all about the same height within a few you know, inches, give or take, right? All the heads in the park all line up. Yeah, so you're going far. If it's straight, it's all, you know, it's like that. The only thing that gives you the illusion, it's not that they get smaller back there. The heads all say, it's the distance between their feet that go back. And so it's the perspective of that. But when you're at eye level, everything is level. Number 12, memorization. Remember how we talked about going to and get, coming up with a concept, key one? Well, that seven minutes is gone. And you have to generate the memory of that. If you can generate how lights and shadows work, you can generate anything. You know, so, so that's the key for producing really great composition. If you're, tr if, if you're painting, when I did my television show, we would go out at six in the morning and the cameraman would say, what are you gonna paint? And at six in the morning in the parks, well, we'd be out there at four. By the time we started painting, you know, starting, 
be six in the morning, so it's dark. You know, all these videos are on YouTube if you want to watch them. But uh, he, I go, when, when the light hits that, I want that, and I want that, and I want that, and I want that. So it'd be like flowers, light on the trees and stuff. Because we knew we only had, especially in summertime, half hour to nail all that stuff. And then we would start painting. And I, while I would go through painting, I would end somewhere around 11, 12 o'clock when everything was flat. But while I was painting, I had to memorize how the light hit the flowers. I had to memorize how the light hit the trees. I had to memorize how all these things actually, um, you know, were at, at five and six in the morning. And I could regenerate it out of my mind because I had mastered how light works. And that's what we'll be teaching you in the next few weeks. But when you have that, you can memorize how the light hit that daisy or that tree or all that. And the thing is, if you don't have a good memory skill, you can develop that too. You know, people watch accidents all the time. Crazy accidents. They're so crazy that you run up to see if somebody's okay and the car drives off. And then the police department says, did you get the license plate? You go, no. And they go, come with me. And they put you in a quiet room and there's some lady there dressed in a gypsy outfit. And she puts you into hypnosis. And she said, what was that license plate? And you go, 4C333C3. You'd be amazed at what your brain can remember. It's accessing it. The reason why you can't access that part of your brain when you're working on it is that you're going, holy shit, what was that? And you put your left brain into focus, and you know, you're working your left brain trying to remember it. When your right brain is going, relax a little and I'll give you the information. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, a spouse screaming, screaming, where are my car keys, where are my car keys? And the wife's going, if you're just quiet for a second, I could tell you where I saw them. No, there couldn't be anywhere you know, right? So. I don't know, I just make this stuff up. But anyway, so, so anything you see, so you can access that part of your brain. And the thing is, we access that all the time when we get into that artist zone. And you'll be surprised that in there, every tree you ever saw, every snowflake you ever saw, everything is there. It's all in there. The only thing is the key is to try to turn that left brain off and we'll try to show you some exercises to be able to do that. Number 13, angles. Angles refine focal points and the effect of light. And I cannot tell you when, when, I, when I look at people's paintings and, and the thing is, I never really dawned on me, really, if you want to get something to make something really look good, there's only one angle that light comes in, depending on what time of day is. Okay? And if your tree is vertical and your meadow is horizontal and your sky is coming this way, Nothing in that area is going to get this uh, uh, light on it that's going to be crucial to become a central focal point. Only until you get a rock that actually is perpendicular to the light. The light comes down at an angle like this. You need an angle that bounces that back. It bounces it to you. That becomes a central focal point. That's why when you look at a ball, it's not the whole area of the ball, that, the light on the ball. It's just one little tiny spot that is perfect that reflects the angle of the sun. And everything you look at has to have that. And the central focal point can't be the central focal point unless it is really perpendicular. So as the light's changing, you have to find things. And you know, one of my students up in Canada, she's the one who's writing the book, and she's like, where's my central focal point? I said, well, it's obvious. She's doing a cabin. I said, it's the roof. Because the roof is exactly the same angle as the sun. There's, no, there's not anything in the painting, and, and you can't use anything in the painting if that's present. You could pretend it's covered by clouds, which we covered half the house over with, so that that central focal point was like the size of an A, because the central focal point shouldn't be any bigger than that. And it should be up front, and we'll talk about this too, to make it three-dimensional. But without that angle on every object, you got to look for it. So if it's vertical, it's going to have a hard time becoming a central focal point. But what would be on a tree that's vertical is a branch. And if the branch hangs off of a tree like that, 
It's actually the, the branch that would actually reflect the light and not the trunk. And chances are the trunk would actually be more in shadow anyway. The meadow? Yeah, it could be. But the thing is, you know, if you have a meadow that's flat like that, it's going to flatten the, the light. Tree, that angle of the branch is going to be what you want. Central focal point. So anyway, there are the 13 keys. We'll go through them as we go into this. There's so much to learn. And with my stories that I like to tell, because it's my channel, it's going to take a while. So watch on YouTube. This will be posted up on YouTube if you want to watch this, plus an element of what we're going to be talking about, which is the critique. And then I'm going to be painting. The painting part will be on Patreon. Hopefully I can get that up this weekend and get that on there. And people on Facebook, watch us next week at 1 o'clock. And then the beginning in July, we're going to 2 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Anyway, thanks a lot, and we'll see you next week. Boy, that was a lot of fun. As you can see, there's so much information that we have to share before we can move on. And we're doing it step by step. If you wish to get more information about what's going on, go to my website at www.stephanbauman.com. And there you can find information about my PBS show, The Grand View, my YouTube station, everything you want to know about the Bauman Effect and what we're trying to create. And you can also register for a free book on everything I know about painting. So until next time, be sure to always create art with passion. And remember, never go into your studio unless you plan to change the world. I'm Stefan Bauman. Thanks for watching and you have a grand day.